I need to let you know that this lesson that we're about to dive into, I have prayed over constantly, and I am somewhat apprehensive to bring this message to you. It's not a new message, but it is a hard message. It's a hard message because it addresses us. Uncle Dennis, uh, Dennis Simmons, one of our shepherds in class, he made the reference that sometimes when you look into Scripture, the hard thing is that it reflects back a picture of you that you don't really like to acknowledge. Sometimes when you look into Scripture, it looks right back into you and it reflects a picture of your life and it reminds you that you have not been completely conformed to the image of Christ. And so there are some lessons for us to learn. And so this morning, I've asked several men to pray over the words that come out of my mouth. Um, And I'm going to ask that you would join me in prayer. Uh, These fellows are going to be praying for me as we're praying over this time. And then we're going to dive into this lesson. Let's go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, it is our great honor to be here Father, it is our great honor to be called your children. Father, it is our great honor to be part of this ministry. God, this morning, it is our prayer that you would continually lift our eyes to heaven. Father, that we might see your calling. Father, that you would prick our hearts and that we would feel the conviction of your Holy Spirit. God, that we might be your people, that we would grow into the image of your Son, and Father, that we would not stay in immaturity. Father, it is the desire of this congregation that we would mature, Father, that we would grow up. And Father, in some ways, that's why we're going through this series, just looking at your Son's life, Father, to allow Him to speak into our existence. And Father, challenge us personally. Father, that we would live as disciples, as children of yours, set free by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, it is my prayer this morning that you would be merciful upon the speaker. For his sins are many. Father, may he not speak anything that is outside of your desired will. And Father, if something comes out of this pulpit that is not from your Spirit, God, I pray that it is blown away like the chaff. But Father, that your Spirit would do the work of sticking the message to the hearts of those in the audience and Father, sticking it to mine. Father, that we would honestly come here in humility to be transformed by the power of Your Word. God, this is our prayer this morning. It is in Your Son's precious and holy name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, open them on up to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3 is where we're going to be this morning. And as you're turning over there, I want to say welcome Uh, To our visitors or those who are stopping back in to visit with us after uh, an extended stay away, it is good to have you back with us. If you're here for the first time, we're thankful to have you here. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to try to catch you up to speed, if you will, of what we've been looking at over the last several weeks. Uh, Three weeks ago, we started a series titled Jesus, A Story from Mark. And what we are basically doing is we are looking through the gospel of Mark at the life of Jesus. And and our hope and our desire is that we would get a clearer picture of Jesus and his ways. And this series actually started almost about a year ago. I was reading a book called Christless Christianity by Michael Horton, a decent book overall. But but the thing that really caught my attention was his crazy suggestion that the church, that a number of churches, are starting to miss Christ and the gospel. That just sounded crazy to me. I mean, we're the church. (laughs) 
We're in the Jesus business. This is what we do. Like we talk about Jesus, we represent Jesus. And yet I think the question that Mark would ask us is do you really know Jesus? Do you really know this man? Or do you just think you know this man? Do you really know his ways? Or do you just think you know his ways? I've talked about this story a couple times in this series, and I'll continue to refer back to it. In Mark chapter 8, uh, Peter and all the other disciples, they're asked a question, and the question is, who do you think that I am? Who do you believe me to be? And Peter gives the answer that Mark has already declared is correct. Peter looks at Jesus and he says, you are the Christ. See, Peter knows Jesus. Peter knows Jesus, or at least he thinks he does. Because what Mark will reveal, and only a couple verses later, is that Peter doesn't know Jesus as well as he thinks he does. And this is one of the great dangers for the church. That we would spend time with Jesus, that we would study about Jesus, that we would use the correct terminology about Jesus, that we would do many mighty works in Jesus' name and yet miss or neglect a significant aspect of who Jesus is. This is why we're working through this series. Because it is our desire, it is our hope that if there is anything inside of us, that it would come out. John the Baptist said, he must become greater and I must become less. And this is our hope. And in a way, this is the direction our text takes us into this morning. A direct address of people who believe they know God, but really, they know Him not at all. So if you've been working through this series with me, you know that I've been asking you, I've been inviting you, I've been encouraging you to come along on this journey by jumping into weekly readings. If you grab the bulletin at the end of the service, in the middle of that bulletin, there will be an on your mark reading. And it is your opportunity to get on your mark. And what it will do, if you're visiting with us, basically this reading will take you through the gospel of Mark throughout this series, but it will also prepare you for the following week's lesson. And if you read that reading this last week, what you probably noticed is that our reading addressed a certain group of people that just started showing up in Jesus's ministry. See, Mark chapter 2, pretty much in a nutshell, has Jesus interacting or being compared to the religious leaders, whether it be the scribes or the Pharisees. And here's here's the basic gist, here's the basic storyline of Mark chapter 2. The more that Jesus and the scribes and Pharisees interact, the more these two parties meet the more the scribes and the Pharisees despise Jesus' name. The more they get to know this guy, the more they hate this guy. The more they see what he's about, the more they decide, hey, you know what, this guy really isn't part of us. Mark chapter 2, in a nutshell, is a highlight reel of confrontations between Jesus and the religious elite. Actually, if you start looking at the sections that often uh, different interpretations, different translations will put out there is that you see a pattern running through Mark chapter 2. In the very first section, you have a story of Jesus coming back into Capernaum. And the story is that there's this man that can't come in to be healed. Jesus is teaching. Everybody is surrounding him. His friends decide that they'll have the bright idea. They climb up on the roof. They open up the roof just to let him down. And the question is... Why would Jesus say what he says? And the thing he says is, son, your sins are forgiven. 
The very next section in your scriptures will find Jesus addressing this man named Levi. And he calls Levi to follow after him. He says, you know what, man? You come follow me. And so Levi does. He goes and he follows after Jesus ends up taking Jesus to his house and all these tax collectors and sinners follow. And the question that the religious leaders have is why? Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Very next question is by the people and they're asking Jesus, why? Why do your disciples not fast? And the disciples of John the Baptist and the Pharisees, they do fast. Very next section Jesus' disciples are picking grain in the wheat fields. And another question is why? Why? Look, why do your disciples do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Put your ear up against your Bible. Go ahead, do it. Do it right now. I'm not joking. Put your ear up against your Bible. You can keep doing it. Brett, do it. Jonathan? Okay, thank you. Can you hear it? Can you hear the rising heartbeat of the religious leaders as they get more and more frustrated with Jesus? It almost sounds like a phone. <laughs> it's beating so fast. <laughs> This is, this is Mark chapter 2. And they have this frustration, this irritation with this man. How could he? Why would he? Who does he think he is? And it all leads up to Mark chapter 3 verse 6. That's the pinnacle. That's the, the larger context. These stories aren't just individual stories. They're leading somewhere. They're small stories within a little bit larger story within a little bit larger story called the Gospel of Mark. They're getting frustrated with this man, but they're not the only ones getting frustrated. In Mark chapter 3, you guys are there right now because you put your finger there or your little Bible holder there or you have your iPad open. Mark chapter 3, Jesus is coming again into the synagogue and as he's coming into the synagogue, he notices that there's a man with a withered hand that's there. It's a Sabbath day. Now, verse 2 will give us the idea that this is a setup. You have these religious leaders, and they're sitting, and they're watching. They're kind of scoping things out. And what they want to see is if Jesus would heal this man on the Sabbath. Now, let's, do, let's take a moment to do a little bit of teaching here. The Sabbath was a holy day for the Jews. Most of you guys know this. The Sabbath, the word Sabbath, comes from a Hebrew word meaning to cease or desist. To cease or desist. And it found its roots in the idea that on the seventh day of creation, God rested. He ceased from his labor. And the expectation was that Jews would do the same thing. You didn't do work on the Sabbath. You didn't do any work on the Sabbath. And so they sit watching to see whether Jesus, this is the idea going through their religious minds, will Jesus dishonor the Sabbath? Here's the thought going through their mind. Will Jesus ignore, listen to this, will Jesus ignore Scripture? So coming back to our text, Jesus calls this man over. And he looks at the religious leaders. And starting in verse 4, he says the following. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save life or to kill? Now, that's kind of a weird question to ask, don't you think? I mean, most of us here, we hear that question, we think, well, that's a dumb question. 
I mean, no offense, Jesus, but you, it's always better to do good than to do harm. My mama didn't raise no dummy. It's always better to do good than to do harm. But in the minds of the Pharisees, in the minds of the scribes, in the minds of the religious elite of that time, within their interpretation, that was not a given. You didn't do work on the Sabbath. You don't do work on the Sabbath. Say it with me. You don't do work on the Sabbath. Again, you don't do work on the Sabbath. This was ingrained in their mind from a very early age leading on up, and the Pharisees believed in this. There's actually a popular document that records 39 things around the Sabbath that you couldn't do, so that way you wouldn't dishonor the Sabbath. And so, in verse 4, you see their response. They're silent. They don't say a word. See, because in their mind, they're in the right. In their mind, they're looking at Jesus, and they're not even thinking about what he's asking. They're not even giving credit to what Jesus is asking. They're not considering. They're not really listening. What they're really doing is they're watching. What they want to see is whether Jesus would break the scriptures. What they want to see is whether Jesus would dishonor the Sabbath. This is what they're paying attention to. And if you look at your text, Zach, go ahead and put up on screen five and six. Jesus ends up healing this man. but he doesn't do it in dishonor to the Sabbath. He he doesn't do it and in the process ignore Scripture. See, what we know about Jesus' character, what we know about Jesus is that he has a perfect understanding of how to practice the law. Jesus has a perfect understanding of how to interpret the scriptures. But here's the problem. The Pharisees, they believe they have a perfect understanding of the scriptures. They've arrived. There's no learning left for them to do. They've been perfected. In some ways, the Pharisees were considered a restoration movement, a back to the Bible movement. Kind of sounds scary if you think about some of the things that the Church of Christ hold dear. Like I said, I need God's Spirit to intercede here because I know I'm walking on sensitive ground. I do not want to sound like I'm bashing us. What I want is the Holy Spirit to convict us. Look at Jesus' response to these men. These men stand arrogant. These men stand confident. These men believe they know God. They know God's heart. They have the proper interpretation. And look what Jesus does. He looks at them with anger. And he's grieved at their hard hearts. Jesus is so frustrated at these guys, and at the same time, he is so broken up about these guys. 
He's irritated because they're so cocky. He's irritated because they're so confident. They know God, or at least they think they do. The problem is they just don't know God as well as they think they do. And they don't have a heart to listen. They don't have a heart to learn. They don't have a heart of humility. And so they sit with arrogance and they point at Jesus. Jesus does the deed. And there in verse 6, you find out the way the religious leaders are going to respond to Jesus. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him on how to destroy him. Now here's the interesting part of this text that sometimes we miss. The Pharisees and the Herodians, they didn't get along. These two groups were like water and oil. These two groups didn't really see eye to eye. Jesus is bringing enemies together. (laughs) But he's doing so to his own destruction. These guys become so blind, so frustrated with Jesus. Notice what they're doing on the Sabbath. They're working. They don't even see it. They're pointing at Jesus and they're saying, look at what he's doing. Look at what he's doing. He's working on the Sabbath. And so what do they do? They're so caught up in their own little system, they go and they plan, they work on how to destroy Jesus. It makes complete sense. But this is the blindness that comes with arrogance. This is the blindness that comes with pride. This is the blindness that comes when we feel like we have arrived as a movement the church and we do not sit at the feet of the master and let him speak to us that we do not let him conform us to his image Paul himself will say I have not arrived and yet so often we sit on our seat And look down our long noses and we speak to one another in arrogance. I believe God is doing a work in this church that he's liberating us from a legalistic heart. Can I just make this a little like AA for a second? My name is David Wright and I struggle with legalism. How about you? My name is David Ray and I struggle with legalism. I have a tendency to overlook the heart of the law for the letter of the law. I have this ability, this fantastic ability to look at people, point at people, and judge people without demonstrating the mercy that God has demonstrated to me. I have this uncanny ability to sit and believe that I have the right way, that my interpretation is a lot better than yours. And trust me, I know the truth. And I think the question that Mark would pose, I think the question that Jesus would like to pose to us today is do you really? Take, take a step back. If you want, you can put it back on when you walk out the doors, but take a step back. Can you humble yourself for just a second to let Jesus speak into this moment? Can, can you humble yourself for one second to, to wonder if your doctrinal beliefs 
It's the things that at times you've held so dear, so important that maybe, just maybe, they're not as important as you think they are. I'm not saying ignoring Scripture. I'm saying open your eyes up to Scripture. Guys, I'm not saying dismiss the words of Jesus. I'm saying humble yourself at the feet of Jesus to let him shape your eyes, to let him heal your eyes in the way you interpret Scripture. So there is one phrase in this text that really grabbed a hold of me in these last couple weeks as I've been praying specifically over this lesson. And the phrase was found in verse 5. Jesus looks at these men and he's angry with these men. And then it says this. He's grieved at their hardness of heart. And so the title of this lesson, if you grabbed a worship order, is Break My Heart. Because I think that's what we need this morning. I think there's not a person in this room that doesn't need their heart broken a little bit. And if we're honest, possibly a lot. You know the thing as you look through Mark 2, as you you work through this text, you find out that, that the religious leaders, they put all this emphasis on all these things, and yet they miss love. Their idea is that Jesus should heal this man on another day, but not on a Sabbath day. You could wait another day. This man isn't dying, Jesus. And Jesus is like, this is important. And so Jesus grieves at their hardness of heart. The, the, the religious leaders come over to see what Jesus is doing, and he's hanging out with all these tax collectors and sinners. And, and the question is, why would a holy man, why would a holy man be with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus grieves at their hardness of heart. These men put all this emphasis on the Sabbath, and yet they miss the real heart of the Sabbath, that the Sabbath, that man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. And so Jesus grieves at their hardness of heart. And I think... What Jesus is really grieving at, if we could put it in in our own words, is that they're stubborn. And so, break my heart. Can I lead us in a little bit of a confessional for a second? Can I lead us in a, in, a, in a prayer for a second? For all of us, that the Lord Jesus would break our hearts. That he would make us see what is most important to him. That our eyes would be opened to the glory of the king in a healthy interpretation of scripture. Can we as a group, as a community, bend our knees to the throne of heaven and say, we will let you shape the way we do church. We will not lean on tradition over the commandments of God. We will seek after the neglected and the poor, and we will know that other religious people say, why would you hang out with those people but... We do it because heaven has called us to do it. And so, Lord Jesus, break our hearts. 
that we would look at our brothers and sisters. And as we talk in Bible class, guys, if you're a part of our Bible class, you know that it gets hot and heavy the last couple weeks. That as we work together, that as we go through this series, that before we do anything, before we say anything, before we make our comments, that our our first thought, our first thought to heaven would be, Lord Jesus, break my heart. Tear down the stubborn walls. And so this is my prayer. As for me and my household, We will try desperately to let go of ourselves in pursuit of letting the one who gave us his all to shape my eyes. This is my commitment to you. This is my commitment to my Lord. And this is the invitation of Mark to you this morning. Will you humble yourself? Will you let go? And in the process, will you grow to truly knowing the Lord?